This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and this is quite the week for SpaceX. We of course have the amazing Starship development news for the week, but on top of that, the Crew-1 mission has been coming together to launch shortly. This is going to be quite the milestone for SpaceX. Static fire is done and the final preparations are underway. On top of that, we just witnessed the launch of ULA's NROL-101 mission. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Spotted this week was another section for Super Heavy number one. This section is four rings high and is fitted with internal stringers with a label on the side saying LOX3. This is presumably the third of five stacks that will make up the booster's liquid oxygen tank, seen in Brendan's diagram here. On that note, on Saturday a large crane was moved inside the high bay ahead of the stacking of the first Super Heavy prototype. And then on Sunday, two Super Heavy liquid oxygen tank sections were moved into the high bay, each made up of four rings. On the side of these stacks are labels saying BN1 along with aft tank booster and an official diagram of the said booster. From this we now know that the naming convention for the booster prototypes is BN rather than SN. That should avoid a little confusion. Saying a booster number rather than serial number will help people easily identify what we are talking about. So yes, those two sections were then mated together soon thereafter with Nomad here posting this picture showing Super Heavy standing at 8 rings high. Therefore Super Heavy BN1 stacking has officially begun. Also at the build site SN11 stacking began with the middle liquid oxygen stack being moved inside of the mid bay ahead of its mating with the common dome. Along with that the human landing system mock up nose cone was picked up by a crane and was moved to a taller stand. This will allow the team to start to work on the interior of that nose cone. Work is still continuing on SN9 as it waits in the high bay for either its move to the pad or the installation of its nose cone. Also what is presumably SN9's nose cone was spotted inside one of the tents with the two flap attachment jigs. Those jigs are used to align the hinges, actuators and aero covers and are removed before the actual flaps are attached. Soon after the aero covers were then attached and the jigs were removed. Also seen in RGV aerial photography's photo here is SN9's nose cone with those internal stringers and COPVs. This section connects the nose cone to the tank section. Then we witnessed SN12's aft dome being stacked on top of the skirt. Raptor serial number 42 was also delivered to the site this week. However, it is unknown as to which starship that may be assigned to. And here is once again Brendan's weekly build diagram to show the status of all SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy prototypes. On this diagram you might notice that SN10's tank section is one ring taller than SN9 as we spoke about weeks ago. This doesn't mean that the entire vessel is taller in any way, just that the upper fairing section will now be four rings tall instead of the five rings seen on SN8 and SN9. This is a good way to ensure that more welds can be done by the machines instead of manually welding a three and a two ring stack together seen on the current five ring sections for SN8 and SN9's nose cones. To add to this we have actually seen a four stack with stringers included which is likely to be for SN10's nose cone. Now to news at the launch site a whole bunch of pipes were delivered to the orbital launch pad this week. It is believed that these will be placed underground from the tank farm to the orbital launch pad to be used as ground support equipment. Now Elon Musk mentioned some information this week regarding Super Heavy's landing. He is still pursuing the idea of landing the booster so precisely that it doesn't need legs at all. This will require extreme precision with little to no margin for error. However, the benefits of this are definitely worth the undertaking of this engineering feat. The elimination of those four very heavy legs seen in previous designs would be substituted by an increase in payload mass. Every 5 to 10 kilograms of hardware on the booster that can be reduced will it result in an extra kilogram of orbital payload capacity, so well worth the effort. SpaceX wants to achieve the goal of landing the booster directly back on the launch mount so that it's ready for refilling straight away for a prompt reflight. Therefore the times between relaunching each Starship vehicle will be reduced immensely. I quite like the direction that Tony Bella has been heading here with a legless landing system. Perhaps there could be some sort of absorption system built into a cone-like landing pad. 
That is just one idea, of course. Let me know what you think in the comments below. It would be great to see a few perspectives from those with more engineering knowledge. That looks like a pretty sweet way to land it in the dock, especially if the whole cone was some kind of colossal shock absorber. Now, the work on Pad B, which is SpaceX's second suborbital launch mount, is still continuing. It is important to have a backup pad ready to go in case of a rapid unscheduled disassembly. In the near future, we could be seeing two Starships on Pad A and Pad B simultaneously. How cool is that? This week also saw the abort of two static fire attempts and then finally a successful static fire. The test involved igniting the Raptor engines while drawing its propellant from the methane and liquid oxygen header tanks. These header tanks are an integral part of the success for SN8's flight as they hold the reserve fuel to be used during the landing burn. This is not only important to have enough fuel but also for the stability during the belly flop maneuver. On Monday during the first attempt, propellant load began at 8.06pm with engine chill starting a couple of minutes later, denoted by those three triangular vents on the side of the vehicle. We then saw venting coming out of the tip of the nose cone, indicating that the oxygen header tank was being filled and pressurized. However, at 8.30pm, both tanks started detanking and the test was scrubbed for the night. On Tuesday, during the testing window, those three triangular vents opened again at 3.47pm, with the 10-minute siren sounding soon thereafter. However, once again, the tanks were detanked at 4.06 due to an unknown issue. Then finally, just three hours later, SpaceX successfully ignited what seemed to be a single Raptor engine for a duration of five seconds. We did see some debris fly up from the ground that seemed to have originated from the base of the pad, and that looked to be concrete being blasted out, which was then reflecting the light from the ignition. Now we've been hoping to see a little more information on this, but so far, no official updates. All in all, SN8 successfully performed the very first static fire with an integrated nose cone, and is progressing through further testing. So this is all great news, and that is of course the first time that a full-scale Starship prototype has achieved that milestone. So yes, a big shout out to Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight out there throughout the night continuously live streaming these tests. That takes a heck of a lot of patience, especially through scrubs where the nights have not gone to plan. With these prototypes, there have been a number of delays, so thanks Mary for doing what you do. All that, of course, is on top of grabbing those wonderful construction shots during the days, so make sure you're following all the news as it happens right from the source. Likewise, RGV Aerial Photography has been capturing amazing shots from above here. It really lets us see some detail that we wouldn't see otherwise. Just being able to see more of what is going on inside of the high bay here is incredibly awesome. We can see Starship serial number 9 here with its aft fins sitting there waiting for further stacking, and more recent beautiful shots of SN8 waiting patiently on the pad as well. Now I've had a number of comments this week asking why this concrete square being finalised did not connect to the rest of the concrete foundation. Our guess here is that this would be a load bearing pad for a crane that will then be filled around later, but I'm not sure on that. Let us know what you think in the comments below. It's great to see all the thoughts from you in the comments, and thank you very much for all of your engagement on topics like this. Your support of the channel here is just amazing. Every like, comment, and subscription helps a huge amount. I still can't believe that we're on track to hit a quarter of a million subscribers very soon. That is all because of you, and very much appreciated. Now, we had a bit of a surprise static fire of SN8 on Thursday, and it narrowly escaped an overpressure event. SpaceX, it seemed, wasn't planning on conducting a static fire that night, and instead just a wet dress rehearsal. However, as we've seen happen before, SpaceX's plans can change rapidly, which shows how fluid their testing can be. Tank farm venting started at 6.34pm, with those three triangular engine chill vents opening at 6.57. Then the 10-minute siren sounded soon after with a static fire occurring at 7.14 p.m. Now, it is unknown as to what exact test was conducted, but it's believed to have been a two-engine static fire from the header tanks. Right after, what looked to be molten metal was then leaking out from the engine area, which we now believe was an engine pre-burner or fuel hot gas manifold. Elon Musk added that whatever it was caused a loss of vehicle pneumatics. Now, pneumatic systems include the processes that allows the tanks to vent and depressurize. Because of this, the pressure 
pressure in the liquid oxygen header tank was rising, which Elon said would hopefully trigger the burst disc to relieve the pressure, otherwise it is going to pop the cork. Thankfully and luckily the burst disc worked. Elon said that the vehicle appears to be okay and that they'll have to swap out at least one of the engines. So yes, what a very anxious test that was. I think we were all relieved when that burst disc popped. Hopefully SN8 can now be repaired and readied for its 15 km flight, but there is no doubt now that this test is going to cause quite a few more delays. So it now looks like the test may not be as imminent as perhaps it appeared last week. Now, speaking of Starship, I've been a supporter of Casper Stanley for quite some time now. We love the 3D animations dropping all the time by Casper, such as this short clip showing how SpaceX's Starship rocket will control itself in the air. What has been even more exciting for me, though, is tinkering with this beautiful piece of software he's created over the course of the last year called Rocket Explorer. Up until now, it has been a bit of a work in progress with many little features to add, but just over this last week, Casper has released a teaser here telling us that Rocket Explorer is now available to wishlist on Steam. This is awesome news and if you want to check it out all you need to do is boot up Steam there and click that add to your wishlist button. As soon as it's published you'll get a notification that the public early access is available. On top of that of course if you love Casper's work and you'd like to help him keep doing what he loves the Patreon link is in the description. Signing up there will give you early access to Rocket Explorer, insights and updates throughout the month and exclusive renders. Awesome work there mate, I've been tinkering with this for a while now and it is a heck of a lot of fun. The scale of Starship there always amazes me as well. And speaking of which, Eric also created this shot of Starship docked to the International Space Station. I mean, this just blows my mind right there. Just check out the ridiculous size of it. The space station of course is massive on its own and NASA created this graphic way back in 2014 in relation to a soccer field, which just puts that into perspective on its own. Of course, Gameplay Review UK jump in to recreate this shot. As always, it is very cool to see the space station and Starship fly by there in typical Kerbal Space Program fashion. Link to the channel is in the description. Just crazy stuff. And I can't wait to see us launching such massive reusable vehicles. This really will change everything. So yes, coming up here is the moment we've all been waiting patiently for. It has been a very exciting week watching the Crew-1 mission come together. This is going to be an incredible mission with SpaceX's Falcon 9 boosting the Crew Dragon up to the International Space Station with astronauts Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover and Shannon Walker, along with Soichi Noguchi of Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency on board. Having the four crew on board is of course a first for SpaceX. The previous Demo-2 mission, which was the first mission for SpaceX with human passengers on board had just the two amazing astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley. They of course laid down the groundwork to ensure that the vessel stood up to the tasks of that shorter demonstration mission. On Sunday last weekend of course we witnessed the media event at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Here we have the four crew speaking at the event appearing extremely excited about the mission coming up. Of course that is scheduled to launch on the 15th of November which is the day after this video goes live. So by the time you're watching this, the launch may well have already occurred. Now NASA's Administrator Jim Bridenstine we see here making a great speech about the transformation of the space industry and the steps that have occurred to begin commercializing space. Jim has been quite instrumental in supporting this endeavor as well. Of course, it was around this time that it was reported by Aerospace Daily that Jim plans to step aside under a Joe Biden presidency. Jim said that the success NASA has had, especially over these past three years, is due to relationships, not just within the president's administration team, but also other key departments that when combined cohesively make NASA so successful. He also added that the president-elect needs to have someone they trust. He said that he is so grateful to have had the opportunity to lead NASA, but there are also many people that can continue in this role with great success. So yes, it is a little disappointing to hear this news. Jim has done an amazing job, but it's also understandable why he may be making that decision. We wish you all the best, Jim, for your future endeavors when that moment to depart NASA is decided. 
Now, prior to the rollout of the Falcon 9, we witnessed some beautiful shots delivered by NASA and SpaceX. These here show the Falcon 9 with the Crew Dragon capsule named Resilience inside the SpaceX hangar at NASA's Kennedy Space Center on November 9th. This was just before the rollout to Launch Pad 39A. It was also exciting to see the crew there posing in front of the Crew 1 vessel. It is a significant mission, of course, as it's the first crew rotation mission to the International Space Station as part of NASA's commercial crew program. If we compare the progress we are seeing here compared with, say, Boeing Starliner, the difference is clear. In fact, this time 12 months ago, it had almost seemed like a race to see which vehicle would reach the International Space Station and be the first vehicle to fly with astronauts since the Space Shuttle retired in 2011. Boeing Starliner capsule, of course, has had a number of issues since that time and has been held up in testing. As far as we know, it is not expected to be ready until sometime next year. So Crew-1 there was rolled out to the pad where SpaceX shared some beautiful images. One thing to note, of course, is that the Worm logo now has been placed on the second stage this time rather than on the first stage. This seems sensible really because the boosters are reusable on missions that are not necessarily going to be NASA missions. The booster used on the Demo-2 mission designated B-1058 was actually then flown on the Anasus-2 mission and a Starlink launch. This booster for Crew-1 is of course brand new. Interestingly, however, this same booster, if it lands as intended, should be used on the Crew-2 mission, which is planned in March 2021. So this could be the very first booster that will be reused while carrying humans on board. So best of luck there for B-1061. SpaceX has been excitedly tweeting out updates such as this video of the Crew access arm swinging into place. A beautiful time lapse there as the sun rose on Wednesday morning. SpaceX also announced that the static fire of Falcon 9 was completed that same day, reiterating that this will be Crew Dragon's first operational mission to the International Space Station with four astronauts on board. We just can't wait to see it. Make sure that you've got your alarm set. You don't want to miss this one. Now, a few updates on the NROL-101 mission by United Launch Alliance for the National Reconnaissance Office. After several delays, that launch ended up scheduled in late this week, close to the launch of Crew-1. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but just before that, a huge thank you to my sponsor, Brilliant. Without the incredible support here, there is no way we could spend the time that we do to put together this regular content for you. From our point of view here, that support helps us stay consistent in what we do. It is a great fit as well, because many of the course topics available from Brilliant are exactly the type of thing that we like to know more about. We are always talking rocket launches, propulsion and physics to a certain extent almost every episode, but if you would like to go deeper and get a more concrete understanding of these topics, Brilliant is an excellent place to start. Their approach is all centered on active learning and problem solving. It's about visually seeing concepts, interacting with them and then answering questions to get you to think deeper about the topic. Their courses are laid out just like a story and split into small chunks to work on one step at a time. I've just recently been having a good explore around the newly revamped Geometry Fundamentals course. This is a great course to start your exploration of geometry on Brilliant, but there's also a lot of fresh surprises even if you're knowledgeable on geometry. If you are naturally curious and you want to build up your knowledge, consider checking out Brilliant. That would not only be a great thing for your mind, but it's also a wonderful way to support me here. To give it a try, just head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people to follow that link will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, this NROL-101 mission is United Launch Alliance's fifth launch this year. After a number of previous scrubs, the launch occurred late in the afternoon on Friday the 13th. Rising from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, the Atlas V had a 531 configuration for this flight. That means that it had a 5.4 meter payload fairing, three solid rocket boosters, and a single engine Centaur upper stage. Now this mission of course carried a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office, so we really know very little about the payload itself. The live stream was cut right after the SRBs were separated. Once again, some magic shots here from Greg Scott. Awesome work there. Hit up Greg there on Twitter to grab some sweet copies of this mission and, of course, many others. 
Now, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. There is no way that we can continue creating content at this frequency and length without you. The support that you all provide here allows us to increase the time that we can spend, and that is all thanks to the growing list of patrons that we can see right there. Thank you, each and every one of you. As support increases, that helps the entire team. So if you like what we're doing and you'd like to join our awesome patrons, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can have earlier access to the videos to watch before anyone else. You can also have your name listed right there like all of these other amazing people. A massive thank you as well, especially Brendan, Adam and Brenton assisting greatly with video production, and of course to the entire Quality Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for all of these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, do follow me on Twitter and please get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week talking about Starship development, Starlink beta tests and Osiris Rex news. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.